Who's ready to be encouraged? Raise your hand if you've been encouraged by this series. All right, those who haven't raised their hand, we got to talk. No, but um, it's been a it's been a challenge preparing for this message. It's been a probably a couple weeks. I've been meditating, thinking about it, and I've actually gone through a lot of the stuff that I'm, I'm preaching on. I've actually experienced it. The, the pain, the agony, the, the torment. It's like this Christian, this Christian life is not easy. Like it is a struggle. It is serious. Like a lot of preachers preach on Sunday mornings. It's like, yeah, praise God. It's going to be overflowing river. Everything's going to flow. You're going to get your finances right. It's not always like that. It's a struggle, man. Like it really is a struggle. And I've really seen that in my life. And I'm going to be transparent with you guys today. Can I, can I be real today? Because yeah. if you guys want me to be fake, I'll go home and I'll come back. Because I, I, I want to be real today with you guys. But I'm going to read the scripture. I got a short video for you guys, and I'm going to jump right into it. In uh, verse 10, it says, By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold when away. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the, war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we'll be ready to punish every act of disobedience when your obedience is complete. Let's pray. Dear God, just thank you, Lord, for today, Lord. Thank you for what you're going to speak today, Lord. Lord, I just ask that you use me, Lord, just as a vessel, just as you would have me be used, God. Allow me to speak with authority, accuracy, Lord, and just boldness, God. And Lord, we just ask that your presence be here, Lord, your power, your grace, your mercy. Lord, let us feel it. Let us embody it, God. Let us know you on a deeper level that we've never known you before, God. Lord, we love you so much, and we're so thankful for all you're going to do today, Lord. Give us laser focus, Lord. Remove any distraction that's going to get in the way. Let the devil not have a foothold today, Lord. You are in control, God, and you're going to do something amazing, Lord. We come with expectation, and we come with intention that you're going to do something, Lord. We love you, God, and we say this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.
So that movie is called Dinosaur. That's one of my favorite movies, man. It came out in <laughs> came out in 2000. I want to I want to see the rest of what happens, but um, <laughs> you guys saw in that video um the the ty Tyrannosaurus Rex comes up, and I I I take that as an example. It's a devil coming up, and one of the other leaders is just like, let's all separate, let's all scatter, let's run. And then Alidor, which is the homeboy, which is one of my favorite characters of all time, he says, no, let's stand together. And that's the title of my message today, let's stand together. Because you see what happens when we don't stand together? The devil picks us apart. He picks us one by one. He looks for the weaker ones. But when we stand together, he doesn't have power over us. He can't defeat us. He's, he only attacks us in separation. He only attacks us in isolation. He only attacks us when we're against one another. He only attacks us when we have anger and frustration and we look at each other and just like, I don't love you anymore. That's the only time he attacks us. And as you saw in the end of that, the, the one dinosaur who, who said, let's, let's all separate, let's do it all alone. What was he doing? He was isolated. He was a complete target for the devil. Say, I'm coming after that guy. And that's what happens when we're in isolation. The devil's like, I'm coming after you. When we have unforgiveness, when we have bitterness, when we have frustration toward one another, when we have pride, when we have ego, the devil's like, yeah, you're my target and you're easy access for me. So just some context. So um, Paul in 1 Corinthians, he, he writes a letter to them. He's, he's talking about them, you know, sexual immorality, the division, the strife, the fact that they were all, they had all their favorite characters. It's like, Paul, I'm team Paul. I'm team Apollos. I'm team Peter. Paul's just like, what is this? This is all division. This is all strife. We're supposed to be together. Right. We're supposed to be united in Christ. Like, what is this? So he sends, he, you would think after that they get it right. Like, oh, yeah, Paul's right. He made sense. It's like, wrong. It's like, who's Paul? Like, dude, we don't care what you have to say. We're not listening to you. And so he has to make that visit, the painful visit. And he comes to them. And he, he has to settle some issues. But still, still, there's, there, there's still division. There's still strife. They're still doing their own thing. And he writes the second letter. And as Dave mentioned before, there's, it's, it said that three letters were written before the second letter. And, it, and, they're, and they're looking at Paul. It's like, Paul, he's, he's so timid. Like, he's so frail. It's like, he, when he speaks, man, he's so boring. Like, he's, he's, not, he's not this guy that, that really should be a church leader or really should be that guy living it out like Christ. Like, they really were all against that. And they were, they were trying to say, Paul, he, well, Paul, he's so bold in his letters, but in person... This guy's nothing. This guy's frail. This guy's weak. This guy has nothing. He doesn't bring anything to the table. So Paul's just like, guys, I'm not trying to act bold. I'm not trying to act tough. I mean, in my letter, I wrote it with anguish and tears. Like, I care for you guys. I love you guys. Like, I just want to see you guys live for Christ. I just want to see a change. That's why he says that by meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. He's like, I'm coming to you with Christ-like love. I'm coming to you with that humility. I'm coming to you guys because I want you to live this out. I want you to experience it. That's why I'm coming to you guys. And then it says in uh, verse 2, I beg that when I come, I mean, I have to be as bold as I expect to be. So Paul wasn't playing no games. Paul was like, I'm, I'm going to have to come and I'm going to have to set things straight. Like, I hope I don't have to. Like, I come with the love of Christ, but man, I gotta, if I got to make some correction, I'm going to correct. <laughs> And then verse 3 says, though we, we, uh, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. How does the world wage war? It's like, it's all off of pride. Yeah. I need this territory. I need this land. Our country has to be the best. We have to be the best. Ego. That's, that's how the world wages war. But we don't wage war that way. We put on the arm of God. And Andrew, if you could pull that scripture up. In, verse, in uh, chapter 6, it says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God, so that you may take the stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rules, against authorities, against the powers of, the, of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil and heavenly realms. The battle is not me against you guys. The battle is not you guys against that, that side against that side. The battle is against the spiritual, the battle against the devil. That's what the battle is against. It's not us. We're so caught up in us, and that's what he wants us to think. What we see, he wants that to be the enemy. What, he, what we see, he wants us to be against each other. What we see, and it's not what we see. It's something that we can't see. It's something that's beyond us, beyond understanding. Yeah. That's why he says put on the armor of God. 
the belt of truth, the, breast, the breastplate of righteousness, the head of salvation, the gospel feet of peace, the, 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 word, the sword, all, all those things to, to fight the devil. That's how we fight him. And we fight him together, not one-on-one. -on -one. As Pastor Vince mentioned last week, we always think it's the devil against us, like it's a one-on-one -on -one thing. It's not the devil against, it's not the devil against just me, it's the devil against all of us. He wants me to be against you guys. He wants you guys to be against me. He wants us to be against each other. That's what he wants. That's what he lives for. That's what gets him excited. That's what gets him pumped. You're upset at your spouse? Yes, I'm coming after that. You're upset with your kids? Yes, I'm coming after that. He loves that. He lives for that. It gets him excited. I've had to, um, I said I was going to be real. I've had to live this out as far as realizing, man, I, I got a lot of work to do. I, I easily can get upset with uh, people in my family. For example, my mom, I, I, had a, I had a situation with my mom and it was going on for a little while. I'm just like, man, this is not right. I had a situation with my dad and I got consent from all these people. Don't worry. I talked to Pastor Dave too. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, Dave, can I get your consent to say this? He's like, you're not going to say the king of kings, the lord of lords, right? I was like, no, Dave, I would never say that. <laughs> but um, I, had a, I had a situation with, um, I mean, if you guys have been under a rock, you, you might not have noticed that, you know, I've been dating a girl for four years. Well, <laughs> we're, 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 no longer t we're no longer dating. We're no longer together. And that's, that's been a battle for me. That's been a struggle for me. That's been like enemy having a foothold on that. And trying to attack me in every single way possible. I'm talking about stress. I'm talking about anguish. Man, when I be real with you guys, it's been hell. It's been hell. And that's what it feels like sometimes. That's what the Christian walk feels, feels like sometimes. It feels like hell. It's a struggle to get up. It's a struggle to wake up in the morning. And that's what the devil wants. And that's when you got to get up and say, no. Amen. God is my glory. God is my strength. God will see me through. God will get me through. So it's, it's been a struggle, and um, it's funny because Paul was writing these, these letters. Paul was, was trying to get them to understand something. We have to be accountable. And, I, and by the Holy Spirit's grace, I, I came up with four observations I was, as I was reading this chapter. And number one is accountability. And accountability really uh, equals relationships. It's funny because... Paul's just telling them, you know, we should live this way. We, we cannot do these things. We cannot be against each other. We shouldn't have our favorite leaders. We shouldn't be getting in sexual morality. We shouldn't be doing all these things. And you know what's funny? They were just looking at Paul like, who are you? Who are you to tell us? Why are you telling me these things? And that goes back to how we are in the world. It's like, we don't like when people tell us what to do. We don't like accountability. We don't like being told, hey, man, you probably should... You shouldn't, be doing, you shouldn't be going to that place. You probably shouldn't be drinking this, these type of drinks all the time. You shouldn't be living this way. You shouldn't be staying out late in that area. You shouldn't be doing that. We, we hate that. We don't like accountability. But accountability equals relationships. We need accountability to have relationships. We need accountability to set us straight. We need accountability to get us closer to Christ. We need accountability because we need to function as a body, as a whole. We need people. We need each other. We need each other. So it says in verse 5, it says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought that we make it obedient to Christ. You know how you make every thought obedient to Christ? By living like Christ. You know how you make every thought obedient to Christ? By having relationships. You know how you make every thought obedient to Christ? By understanding that I cannot function in the body. I cannot function in my walk. I cannot function in my day-to-day -day living if I'm against my brothers, if I'm against my sisters, if I'm against my mom, if I'm against my dad, if I'm against my girlfriend, if I'm against anyone. I can't live that way. So it's funny because I mentioned that second part. It says relationships. Relationships are so key, man. Like, I'm really learning that in my life, man. This man's always preached that to me. Relationships are so key. I'm just like, yeah, relationships are cool, man. But I want to do this thing by myself. I want to see what God could do through me. I want to show everybody. I've lived that way all my life. And I realized, man, I need relationships. I need function. So I mentioned I've been going through struggles. I've been going through, through all, these, all these things. And I'm like, Man, I've had my brothers, man, Stephen and Josh, man. They've been there with me, man, through the struggles, through the pain. Steve let me sleep on his couch, man. I said, that's a brother, man. <laughs> and it's funny because um, the young adults, we went on a retreat, and by God's grace, I don't know how, they, they all end up sleeping in that one house. And me and Josh ended up being in the cabin by ourselves, man. We slept on separate beds, I promise you. <laughs> 
But man, let me tell you, man, I, I was going through my things and Josh is just pouring into me. He's like, man, that's not of God, man. You are a loving man. Like God is with you. God is for you. Don't worry about that. God is with you. And then me, and then he has his thing and he's going through his struggles. I'm like, man, God is with you, man. God's got you. Man, God loves you. God is pouring into you. The Holy Spirit is moving, man. God's all these things. And I realized that's how we defeat the devil. Amen. That's how we win. Yep. That's how he doesn't have a stronghold over us. When we're together, when we're united, when we're saying, you know what, this is not how we live. You have an issue with that person, fix it. Talk to them. Love on them. Yeah. Ask for forgiveness. Yeah. Surrender to his will. Surrender to what he wants for your life. Surrender to the fact that he wants you to have relationships. He wants you to operate in that power. And it's only through relationships. It's only when we're connected. It's only when we're united. It's only when we're together. It says in verse 6, and we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. So some of the Corinthians, they understood what Paul was saying. They're like, you know what, Paul? You're right. We're not living like Christ. We probably shouldn't be having this strife and, and this division and all these other things. We probably shouldn't be engaging in these activities. You know what? We're going to repent. But some of the, the leaders were just like, what? Like, you're telling us how to live like Christ? You're poor? You're weak? You're all these other things? We're living the good life, man. We're all the way up here. We're on a mountain, man. We're wealthy. We got people paying us for our services. And that's why Paul was saying, you know, these false apostles are, are these super apostles, mocking them, saying, man, these guys are, these guys are, they're not the real deal. And I, I came up with a second um, observation. It's uh, condemnation versus conviction. Condemnation versus conviction. You got to think that, put yourself in the Corinthian their, their shoes, the church leaders, the super apostles. Paul's telling them what they should be doing. They, they haven't gotten it right yet. They still haven't gotten it right yet. They're still making the same mistakes. And they had to think, man, I remember in the first letter when he told us we didn't have it right. We still don't have it right. And you know what's funny about condemnation? It puts you down. It brings you to shame. It, for, it forces you to look at yourself. But you know what conviction leads you? Conviction leads you to Jesus. Conviction leads you, you know, I need to fix my mistakes. Conviction says, you know what? I'm not going to look at myself. I'm going to change my ways. I'm going to surrender. And I had to look at my own self because I named all those people that, that I've had battles and situations with. And it's funny because we always look at that other person. We don't really look at ourselves. We really look at what we need to work on. We really don't look at what we need to change. It's always that other person. They need to change. They need to operate on a different level. They need to humble themselves. They need to surrender. No, we need to surrender. <laughs> And I realized I had to surrender. And my dad told me something, man. I didn't like it, man. Sometimes truth, sometimes truth hurts, and it stings, and it sucks, if I could say that. <laughs> Don't throw stones, please. I got <laughs> pebbles. Help me with stones. But it, it stung, man. And when someone says truth, and you don't want to humble yourself to it, I said truth. When you don't want to humble yourself to it, it hurts. It's, it's, it's painful, and it leads you to condemnation. It leads you to shame. It leads you to yourself. It leads you to put yourself down. But it's funny because I realized something. When we're, when we're down and when we feel like people are putting us down, it's, it's not really people putting us down. It's us being convicted of the truth. Because I said condemnation leads us to ourselves, but conviction leads us to Jesus. Conviction leads us to want to change. Conviction leads us to want to humble ourselves. And I was beating myself up because I'm like, man, I've made mistakes in my past. I have things that I'm going on from my past that I haven't let go that are still holding me down. And I don't know who I'm talking to today, but you have some mistakes in your past. You have some things that are holding you down. You have some things that are making you feel like you're not like Christ. You're not worthy to live here. You're not worthy to be in the church. And I'm here to remind you that what the devil meant for harm, God meant for good. God meant for good. And I had to come back to that realization of myself, what the devil was trying to put me down on. Yeah, it was true. Yeah, it was something that I had to change. But it didn't mean I had to live there. It didn't mean I had to take it in. It meant I had to change and say, you know what? I'm going to focus on Jesus. He's going to change this. He's going to fix it. He's the author and finisher of my faith. He's the only thing that can bring me to the end of myself and bring me to him and find freedom and peace in life. It's only him. Verse 7, it says, it says, you are judging by appearances. If anyone is confident that they belong to Christ, they should consider again that we belong to Christ just as much as they do. We judge a lot by appearances. There's two ways we judge. We look at somebody and just like, we look at their clothes, we look at their stature, we look at their posture, their position. Just like, 
you look kind of poor, you look kind of frail, you look like you really don't have much going for you. You look like you're not a person of authority or position. I'm not really going to listen to anything you have to say. And that's what these apostles are looking at Paul and saying, I don't know, dude, like your sneakers are just a little scratched up, man. They got some holes in them. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to listen to you. And then there's another way we judge. We look at people with stature. We look at people with wealth. It's like, man, he got a suit on. He's got a tie. He's got some nice shoes. He looks like a person in position. So when he talks, I'm going to listen, man. He has authority. He can speak. But it's not about how you look. It's about how you live it out. It's not about how people see you. It's about what's inside. And only God sees what's inside. As a was talking about the message, God doesn't look at the outward appearances. He looks at inside the heart. That's what God looks at. So these church leaders are judging by appearances. Judging each other by appearances. And I realize I judge by appearances. And I realize I've been judging myself. And I'm going to tell you why I've been judging myself. You get to a certain place where people start seeing you a certain way, whether you get a platform, whether you start getting a leadership position, whether whatever the case may be. And people start saying, wow, he looks like he's loving. He looks like he has it together. He looks like he lives a certain way. And then I realized something. It's not about how people see you. It's about the heart. It's about how Christ sees you. And I started to realize something. These mistakes and everything I've been going through, it's been taking me to a deeper level because Christ is trying to convict me. That can love on a deeper level. That can go on a deeper level. That It's not about how I'm looking on the outside. It's about what's on the inside. So God was convicting me and saying, you know what, Jonathan? It's not about how people see you. It's not about a platform. It's about how much do you love people and do you truly love people? Because it's not about what you say. It's not about what you speak. It's not about what you preach. It's about what I see inside of you and how you pour your heart into others. That's how I know you're actually walking the walk. So I had to get convicted on that. I had to, I had to come to that realization. And it's funny because... When you start to realize that, number one, you've made mistakes and you're not exactly living it out as, as much as you could, you start to realize something. You start to realize, wow, all these people that I were looking at, they're exactly not walking the walk that I thought they're not. I should probably have grace for them. I should probably have grace for them. I should probably see them a different way. And that's my third observation. I believe that the Corinthian church was not having grace for others. I believe they were not having grace for others. They had the, the, this division of these are the ones who have it together. They live a certain way. They look a certain way. And the ones that are more frail, the ones that are weaker, the ones that <laughs> look a certain way, they don't have it. And it's funny because to the world, this makes sense. To the world, it's just like, yeah, the, they do have it together because obviously God is favoring them. Obviously God is for them. Look at them. Look at, look at what they're showing. Look at their results. And if we could pull up 1 Corinthians 2. It says, this is what we speak, not in words taught by us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit. Explaining spiritual realities with, with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are certain only through the Spirit. What does that mean? It means when you start living separate from the world, they don't understand your choices. It means when you start living separate from the world and you start forgiving people, and you start loving people, they don't understand that. They say, why are you doing that? They, they did this to you. They harmed you in this way. They did all these things. Why are you forgiving them? And you say, I'm not living by the world. I'm not living to what you think. I'm living to what God thinks. I'm living to God according to God's word. I'm going to love the way he loves. I'm going to see people the way he sees them. I'm going to provide grace the way he provides grace. I'm going to see him through his lens, not my lens. And that's what we do. We see people through our lens, our love. And as, as Vince was saying last week, it's like in Romans 5, 5, it's like, it's not about our love. It's about his love that's poured into us by his Holy Spirit, his love. We cannot do it in our life. It's not by might. It's not by power, but by his spirit, he says. It's by his spirit. Judging by outward appearances. In verse 8, it says, for even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord gave us for building you up rather than pulling you down. I would not be ashamed of it. Sam said something key in his message. He was talking about how we are to encourage. We're not to necessarily always look to correct someone. And, and they were looking at Paul just like, you're trying to correct us in your letters. You're acting all tough. You're acting all bold. Paul's just like, really, I have the authority to encourage you guys. Really, that's what I was really trying to do. I'm not really trying to be destructive. I'm not trying to put you guys down. I'm just trying to get you guys to another level. Another level that's like Christ. Not like yourself, but like Christ. 
In verse 9, it says, I do not want to seem to be trying to frighten you with my letters. For some say his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person, he is unimpressive. And his speaking amounts to nothing. His speaking amounts to nothing. Such people should realize that what we are in our letters, when we are absent, will be in our actions, when we are present. It's funny, I mentioned that they said Paul didn't have much speaking talent. It's like when Paul spoke, it's just like, man, is this guy done, man? I can imagine Paul preaching his heart out. Man, we are for Jesus. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus is here for us. And these super apostles are just like, is he done? Because I want to preach to him about some prosperity gospel, man. I want to preach about something that's going to change their life. I mean, their finances is going to shoot through the roof, man. They just got to pay me. And Paul, and, Paul, and Paul wouldn't take any finances. Paul wouldn't take money. And that's how you know he was a true leader. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not going to go into that, but it's just like, Paul was doing it out of the goodness of his heart. He was literally doing it for Christ. He's like, I don't need these material things. I need Jesus. And so do you guys. You don't need material things. You need Jesus. Amen. His love changes you. Not a material thing. Not wealth. Not a suit. Not a tie. Not none of these things. It's Jesus. You know, so Paul wasn't, he wasn't really, he wasn't a great speaker like somebody like Apollos. Like they said Apollos was a very eloquent speaker. Like when he spoke, man, he just spoke with such accuracy. Like he spoke like he just, people could feel it. Paul, Paul didn't necessarily have that effect on, on the ones who wanted something impressive. And I'm here to tell you that there's, there's people in this room that you want something impressive. You want something that's going to blow your mind. You're looking for that spectacular. You're looking for that, oh my goodness, oh, this grandiose thing. It doesn't come like that. And the more you look for that, the more you live for that, the more you're going to be disappointed because it's not looking for that. That's not going to fill your soul. That's not going to complete you. The only thing that's going to complete you is the love of God. The only thing that's going to complete you is, 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 is Christ. The only thing that's going to complete us is each other. That's the only thing that's going to complete us. Our relationships, how we are with one another, how we live for each other, how we fight for one another, how we live in this body together. That's the only thing that's going to complete us. So you had to think, Paul, he's not really an impressive speaker. You know, he's, he's okay. He's frail, he's weak, he's all these other things. Mm. What's, what's, so, what's so good about Paul? And I'm here to remind you, it's not about how impressive you come across to people. It's not about what you bring to the table. It's not about, wow, God, this guy is so amazing. Because when we look at Moses, Moses was unqualified. When we look at Peter, Peter was cutting ears off. When we look at Abraham, it's like these guys were not qualified. But it's not about being qualified. It's about God choosing us. It's about God calling us. It's about his love and what he does through us. Amen. It's not about how the world sees. It's not about outward appearances. It's about what's in the heart. So start telling people when they start putting you down and they start saying you're not this, you're not that. You say, you know what? I'm focusing on the love of God. I'm letting it transform me. And you may not see something, but something's going to show. And it's not by my effort. It's about what God's going to do through me. Wow. It's about him. Wow. So it says in verse 12, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. Man, these, these super apostles are just like, we're the, we're the top dogs. I don't see anybody else around us. Isn't that funny how we do that in church? Isn't that funny how we do that in the world? Man, I'm looking around. I don't see nobody that's on my level. Man, that, that guy can't do it. I love you, Lawrence. That guy can't do it. I love you, Steve. Like, this is, this is how we act. But it's just funny because we're not supposed to compare ourselves by what we see. We're supposed to compare ourselves by what we don't see. And that's Jesus. And that's God. It's about him. When we compare ourselves to him, we realize, wow, I am a sinner. When we compare ourselves to him, it's like, wow, I need some work to do. When we compare ourselves to him, it's like, wow, maybe I'm not so as good as I thought I was. Maybe I do need to change. Maybe I do need to love on a deeper level. Maybe I do need to humble myself. Maybe I do need to submit to his will. Maybe I do need to get on my knees. And that's what I realized in my own life. It's like, wow, you thought you were doing something. You thought that God was doing something amazing. But yet you're looking down at your, the other people who are not at the same walk. That's right. And that's what the super apostles were doing to, to these weaker Corinthians, looking down at them like they were infants. And it's like they're feeding their minds with the wrong things. We can't live that way. We can't look at down at other people. We can't judge by outward appearances. We have to start looking at their hearts. That's right. And we have to start judging by that sense. 
Judge him by that measure. Not judge him by anything else but that. Because when we answer to God, it's not going to be, wow, you did all these amazing things. Wow, you healed so many people. Wow, you had this platform. You had this ministry. It's about, wow, did you love people? Did you die for them? Did you give your heart for them? Did you, did you pour into them? Did you give everything for them? Did you get to a point where you said, my schedule and what I have to do, that's not more important than these people. What people expect of me and, and this calling, it's, it's not more important than these people. And that's what Paul was trying to get them to understand. It's like, it's about people. It's about loving people. That's all it really comes down to. You might be thinking to yourself, well, people have hurt me. People, people stink. <laughs> people, people are no good. I'm here to tell you that not every relationship that I have in my life is fixed. Not every relationship I have is settled. But I'm counting on God and I'm trusting in God to say, you know what, God, I can't do this by myself, but you will do this through me. You will change my heart. You will transform my heart. I can do this with you. Because like I said, when we're, when we're against each other, when, we, don't ha when we, we, we have division, when we have strife, we don't have peace. And that's what we're really after is peace. We're after joy. We're after freedom. And that only happens when we forgive. That only happens when we surrender. That only happens when we're connected. And when we say, I'm not going to put anything above the relationships in my life. I'm not going to put anything over community. There's nothing more important than that. And I'm starting to see that in my life. There's nothing more important than being connected. There's nothing more important than walking around saying, I have no enemies. What did Jesus say? He said, pray for, pray for those who abuse you. Love those who hate you. It's like, wow, that doesn't make any sense. I'm looking out for your well-being, son. I'm looking out for your well-being, daughter. Forgive. Move forward. Build relationships. That's all that really matters. And in verse 13, it says, We, however, will not boast beyond proper limits, but will continue our boasting to the field God has assigned to us, a field that reaches even to you. We are not going too far in our boasting, as would be the case if we had not come to you. But we did not get as far as you with the gospel of Christ. Neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting of work done in others. Paul's saying, man, we are focused on our lane, man. Think of track runners. We are focused on our lane. We're not focused on their lane. We're not focused on what they're doing. We're focusing on what we're doing for God. We're focused on what we're doing for Christ. We're focusing on loving others. We're not focused on the other outside like we do. We're always focused on the outside. Where's our race? Where does God want us to do? Where is God moving us? Where is God convicting us to do? Got to have that dead center focus. And it says, so that we, will, we can preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. For we do not want to boast of our work already done in another man's territory. But let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one who the Lord commends. Yes. Amen. So these apostles were boasting in their work, boasting in what they're doing. Look, I got finances. Look, people are coming to us. Look at our ministry. Our ministry is booming. And Paul's like, I'm not focusing on my ministry. I'm focusing on Christ. I'm focused on saving lost souls. I'm focusing on making a difference. I'm focusing on things that people are not going to notice, but I'm focusing on pleasing my father because I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to focus on him. And that brings me to my last observation. I think the Corinthians were struggling to understand love. Our world is struggling, suffering from a lack of love, from a lack of love. Like we're not loving each other. Like we're not putting our lives out for each other. We're not being there for one another. And I realized I'm suffering from a lack of love. I can love better. I can be a better man. I can allow God to use me more. I can go on a deeper level. Because you see, it's actually not about how strong we are. It's actually not about how people necessarily see us. Like, wow, you're a great man. You're a great woman. You got a lot of things going for you. Because really, those are surface level things. It really comes down to what's underneath that. That's right. And not a lot of people can see what's underneath that. 
I mean, you can kind of hide that. You can kind of put that in your closet. You can kind of show up on your best day and say, man, this is me on a Sunday morning. I got it together. I love people, man. You could trust me. You could count on me. You could vote for me. <laughs> that's, that's how we operate. That's how we operate. We put in our best performance, man. We're performers out here, always performing. But when you go home and you lay in your bed, there's no performing. There's reality. There's real. There's transparency. There's wall. There's vulnerability. That's what showcases. So I had to, I had to, um, I had to go to my mom and say, you know what, mom? I was wrong about a lot of things. Um, you try to make an effort to talk to me, and I really don't always put forth that effort. I'm always stuck in other things. I'm stuck in my phone. And these are for any kids here, man. Your parents be trying to talk to you, and you're just in your phone, and you're just in some kind of book. Not really a book. You guys are on Instagram. Let's be real. But you guys, <laughs> you guys are always getting distracted by something. And I was like, you know what? This woman raised me. I should probably humble myself a little bit more. I should probably realize that when I'm against my mom, and I notice it, man. When I got beef with my mom, man, the devil attacks me, boy. He gets on my nerves. <laughs> and I'm like, I probably should humble myself and ask my mom for forgiveness, but I don't do it all the time. And I'm starting to realize by reading this and by actually living it out that, man, I don't want the devil to have a stronghold in my life anymore. I don't want the devil to hold me down anymore. I don't want the devil to play mind games on me. I don't want the devil to say I have power over you. I don't want the devil to have me crippling at night, tossing and turning because I haven't forgave somebody, because I haven't asked for their forgiveness, because I haven't loved on them. I don't want that anymore. I don't want to live that way because I want to live the way God wants me to live. I want to have peace in my life. I want to have life in my life. I want freedom. I want joy. I want something that the world cannot give me. I want something that only can relationships to give me. I want something that only can give me when I'm connected, when I don't have any enemies, when I don't have any strife, when there's no division, when I'm just in love with everybody around me. And I can't do it in my own strength. I can't do it in my own power. But God is here for that very reason. Yeah. And I had to apologize to my dad, too. I said, you know what, Dad? You were right. He's like, I'm always right. Like, this is why I don't tell you you're right. So I had to humble, I had to humble myself in that sense. And I had to humble myself in one more area. I had to humble myself to um, one, two, three, four, that beautiful woman in the fourth row. I had to say, you know what? There's mistakes that I've made in my life. There's things that I've done in my past that you forgave, but I'm holding stuff against you. And that's what we do. We hold things against other people. Forgetting that they've forgiven us for things we've done. Forgetting that we got our own stuff in the closet. Forgetting that the fact that there's sins and there's things that we have not confessed. Forgetting the fact that we're holding things inside. So I had to go back to my past and I had to make amends with those people and I had to ask for forgiveness and I had to get on my knees and I had to say, God, I'm not who I thought I was. There's some changes that I need to make. I don't love people the way I thought I love people. You are doing a work in me and I trust you, even in this pain, even in this agony, even in this struggle, even in all these things, God, I trust you because I know you're trying to do something that I don't understand. Because I know you're trying to give me the heart that you have. Yeah. So I don't know who in this room is struggling with unforgiveness. I don't know how families are at, at certain homes, whether there's separation, whether there's division, there's strife, where, where certain kids are team mom and team dad, just at the Corinthian church. I don't know. But um, what I do know is that this word has humbled me. I come as a man truly humbled. I didn't come here with jokes. I didn't come here with, let me impress the people. I came here and just to say, I'm going to be real. I'm going to be truthful. I didn't, I didn't even look at my notes because I'm like, I don't need to look at notes because I'm, I actually had to live this out in my own life. I actually had to see this happen. I actually had to get real with myself. Kona, can you come up here real quick? Yo, I told you I was going to call you up here one day. Can we give it up for Kona? Can, can, can we do the handshake? Hey. Come up, come up here. <laughs> You're not done. You're not done. Um, so I, I brought up how the, the devil wants us to break, break up relationships, and he wants us to be against one another. I mentioned her and I, we're, we're, we're still not together. But I realized something. 
I was, I was so hurt and I was, I was saying all these things and, and she was hurt and she was saying all these things and man, the devil was having a field day. The devil was like, man, you guys spent four years together. That must have been a waste. Like that must have been for nothing. And I don't know who I'm speaking to your life, but you might have just come out of a relationship or you might be in a marriage or you might be with family with your kids and the devil's putting thoughts in your head and the devil's saying, run away, don't even be there. Get out of the household, get out of that family, break up with that relationship, whatever the case may be. But I realized something. I had, to un- I had to humble myself and say, you know, I'm sorry for the things that I've done, that I need forgiveness. And, and she did those same things. And I realized something. If her and I can remain mutual, if her and I can remain friends, if her and I can remain with love, if her and I can say, you know what, the devil's not going to have a foothold, the devil's not going to say those four years with her ways, the devil's not going to get in our mind, the devil's not going to do it, he's not going to have power. Because love conquers all. Love changes everything. Love yes. is the game. You can sit down now. <laughs> oh, man. I'm a clown. <sighs> so, yeah, I want to I wanna close with this, guys. There's a, there's a deeper level that God wants us to go in with him. And we're not going to get there when we have unforgiveness. We're not going to get there when we have things that we haven't dealt with from our past. And it's funny because Paul, although they were doing all these things, Paul still had love for them. Paul would still give their life for them. Like Paul's like, I just, I just want you guys to understand And in the same way, God gave his life for us. God loves us. God is here for us. God wants what's best for us. So I don't know what changes we need to make in our lives. I don't know what areas we need to humble ourselves in. I don't know what relationships that we need to mend. But we need to come to a common ground to understand that his love changes everything. His love moves us. His love gives us power. His love gives us purpose. His love transforms us. His love helps us to see things that we don't understand or comprehend. Because it's not about how the world sees things. It's about how God sees things. It's about what His Spirit says. It's about how His Spirit moves us. Let Him change you. Let Him transform you. Help Him to see things that you don't understand. Help Him to see things that you can't even fathom. I don't know, for some people, it's just like, I don't even know what this guy's talking about. It's fine. But what I do know is, God did not come down on this earth for us to be against one another. God did not come down on this earth for us to focus on outward appearances. God did not come down on this earth to show us grace, but we don't show grace for one another. God did not come down on this earth for us to say, I have division, I have enemies, I have strife. No, Jesus gave his blood on that cross so we can understand forgiveness, so we can understand grace and mercy, so we can be connected, so we can be together, so we can understand that. His love is our identity. His love changes us. And his love is the only thing that matters. And that's what I come to the understanding. His love is the only thing that matters. So it's not about what you get. It's not about what you receive. Because His love is enough. And man, when you understand that the love is the most important thing that you will ever receive in this earth, it doesn't matter if you don't get that job. It doesn't matter if that relationship doesn't work out. It doesn't matter if you don't get that house. Because man, if you have love in your heart, man, you have a reason to live. Man, you have a reason to fight. Man, you have a reason to wake up in the morning. Man, you have a reason to say, God, you are everything. I'm going to live for you because I trust you. Because I'm not living for what this earth has to offer me. I'm living for what you have to offer me. And that's something greater. So these light and momentarily afflictions have nothing compared to the exceeding eternal weight of glory. This life is temporary. God's life is forever. So let's submit to his will. Let's humble ourselves. And let's love each other. And let's realize that love changes everything. Love conquers all. 
and love gives us a reason to live. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I come to you as a man that's been truly humbled by your word, Lord. I come to you admitting and owning up to the fact that I haven't always understood what your word says. I haven't always understood love. I always un haven't understood how I need to, to humble myself. But I pray, Lord, in this message that we understand that there's deeper levels in our hearts that you want us to go to. There's walls, there's barriers, there's restrictions that we're putting up or we're putting in our way that you want to break. And you want to make amends with every relationship. You want us to make amends with you. God, you love us. And you died for us. You gave your life for us on the cross. You shed your blood, God. And we're not always living the right way. We're not always showing grace to one another. We're not always loving each other. But God, let this moment not pass. Lord, I pray that whoever needs prayer today, that we come up for prayer, including myself, God. That we say, God, I'm done playing games. God, I'm done being a big shot. God, I'm done with judging from out outward appearances. God, I want to focus on something that you focus on, and that's the heart, and that's my heart, and that's their heart, and that's our heart, and that's the world's heart. Jesus, we can't do this without you. And Jesus, it's hard. It's a struggle. It's a struggle every day, God. It's a struggle waking up. It's a struggle forgiving others. It's, for, it's a struggle, God. But with you, nothing is impossible, God. So again, Lord, if there's anybody in this room who has unforgiveness, there's anyone in this room who is struggling, Lord, with their past, God, set them free today, God. In your name, Jesus, set them free. Allow them to take every, hold captive of every thought that's not obedient to you, Lord. Help them to say, I want to live for you, God. I want to live the way you live. I want to understand your thinking, God, because I have the mind of Christ. That's what your word says. Your word transforms. Your word changes, God. So please. And Lord, if there's anybody in this room who does not know you, God, I pray, Lord, prayer time comes, when prayer time comes, Lord, that they come up here and say, I want to know Jesus. I want to know the love that this guy is talking about because I don't understand this love. This world has never given me this love. But man, this Jesus that this guy is talking about, this Jesus that has changed his life, I want to know it. God, you're our reason for living, God. You're our hope. Forgive us for not always seeing that. Forgive us for thinking that relationships or jobs or material things were going to complete something that you could only complete. And there's this incompleteness for a reason, God. There's this void that we have for a reason, God. And that's not the problem. What's the problem is we're putting it in other things. And we need to put it in you. So, Lord, fill that void today, Lord. Fill us with your love. Put your love in our hearts through your Holy Spirit. And let us dwell in it like never before, God. And we say this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you.